Hi, I'm Bo Van Riper. I'm the research librarian here at the museum and I wanted to take a few minutes today and show you some of the many hidden treasures in the museum archives. The archives live in climate-controlled storage in the basement of the Marine Hospital here, but anybody who's interested in looking through them can come up to the library here and ask for what they'd like to see and I will bring it up to you and lay it out as we've got these things laid out here for you to look at. There are thousands upon thousands of individual items in the archives and they're there because in one way or another they tell part of the story of the vineyard. This document, for example, and its classic antique document, sepia tone, beautiful handwriting, and it just looks and feels and even smells old. But beyond the, wow, I can touch the past, I can touch this document that was originally composed during the War of 1812. It also tells a story. This is a document in which Hezekiah Joel signs over the money that he earned while privateering in the War of 1812 to Thomas Cook of Edgartown. And Valentine Pease also signs over the money that he earned on the sh same ship on the same voyage. Now the interesting thing about this is that Hezekiah Joel was a Chappaquiddick Wampanoag. Valentine Pease was a white mariner from Edgartown who, if the name sounds familiar, it's because he went on to become a whaling captain and shipped some snot-nosed writer named Melville on his ship, the Acushnet, in the 18th 40s, providing Melville, at least until he jumped ship, with the material for writing Moby Dick. If you look at this document in detail, Pease merely signs his name for himself, but Joel, being illiterate, makes his mark and has it witnessed by somebody who says, Yes, that was Hezekiah Joel who made that mark, but further, Hezekiah Joel signing this contract, which was basically simplifying the process of him getting his, paid his money, had to be witnessed and approved by one of the three appointed guardians of the Indians of Edgartown. Because in 1812, Hezekiah Joel was a Native American though he was over 21 years of age, was not regarded by the town of Edgartown as sufficiently competent to enter into contracts on his own. A man like Valentine Pease, who was white, was considered to be fully capable of making those decisions. Hezekiah Joel had to have an appointed guardian of the town of Edgartown approving his business dealings. This is what historical documents do for those of us who try to understand the history of the vineyard, whether professionally like me or as a pastime like many of the people who come here to do research. They illustrate larger stories as well as telling the stories of individual people who were caught up in those larger currents of history. The document that I just showed you, the Hezekiah Joel contract, is a sort of classic looking, if you found it in your grandfather's trunk, you'd go, oh my goodness, this is ancient, this is important, this is significant. But not all historical documents look like that. Some of them look like somebody's grocery list that was scribbled in haste back in the early years of the Republic. Just a tiny slip of paper with crabbed handwriting with missing spots and the words where the pen ran out of ink and the writer was too lazy to go dip it back in the inkwell. 
And yet these tiny, seemingly insignificant fragments also do amazing things in terms of telling us about the vineyard's past. This one, for example, was a list of marriage intentions. Basically, people formerly, formally registering with the town clerk their intention to get married, not that day, but soon, so that if anybody wanted to, ha wanted to object to their being married, they had an opportunity to do so. And here on this list of marriage intentions, you have Jonathan Hillman proposing to marry Sarah Hammett, Peter Norton marrying Elizabeth, somebody or other who I can't read and ran out of ink. Um, someone named Chase preparing to marry Desire Loose. Desire Loose, you can imagine what she went through at school. Um, and Joseph Dias proposing to marry Sarah Manter. He was Joe Dias in Edgartown, but back in the Western Islands, the Azores, he would probably have been Jose Diaz. And he shipped out on a vessel bound across the Atlantic and settled in Edgartown and became a mariner as he'd been back in the Azores. And he married Sarah Manter, who was the daughter of one of the oldest and most prosperous families in Tisbury. Azorian immigrant, daughter of the vineyard, whose, parent, whose family went back literally almost to the first white colonization of the island. This is the face of immigration in America, a story told a hundred thousand times over. Jose Diaz, Joe Dias was Portuguese by culture. His son of the same name who he never, he never knew because he died in a British prison ship during the revolution was American, a harbor pilot in Vineyard Haven. His grandson, Joe III, was one of the founders of Oak Bluffs, a hotel, a hotel owner, a politician, <clears throat> and so forth. This is the beginning of that story. Joe Dias proclaiming his desire to marry Sarah Manter, January 1781. Sometimes it's not just a single document that tells the story. Sometimes it's an entire series of documents. This stack of letters in my hand here are part of a collection of letters that were received by a young woman in late 19th century Edgartown. She was a domestic employee. She was somebody's maid, somebody's housekeeper. And she worked in the big houses on North Water Street, keeping the, keeping the home fires burning, literally and figuratively, so that the people who could afford fancy houses on North Water Street didn't have to. But Sarah Cold had academic and literary ambitions. She was, the letters make clear, ferociously intelligent, widely read, she loved ideas, born into a more advantaged household instead of a poor white Irish American family. She might have gone off to Wellesley or Smith and become an intellectual like one of the Blackwell sisters. Instead, Sarah Colt did her job as a domestic servant and wrote letters, reams and reams of letters, which have come down to us particularly to one Edward Carpenter, who was a teacher at the Martha's Vineyard Summer Institute, lived in Connecticut, New York, a man of learning, a man of ideas, endless letters back and forth between them. Clearly, he was part of her outlet for the intellectual ambitions that circumstances didn't allow them to allow her to pursue herself. And as you read through the dozens and dozens of letters that fill two entire archive boxes, the vast majority of which are from the guy who signed himself, E, you realize something else, that whether Sarah knew it or not, and it's hard to imagine that she couldn't, Edward, who's married and has a family in Connecticut, 
and was clearly too much of a gentleman to ever do anything about it, was deeply, hopelessly in love with Sarah. He begins every letter dearest and he signs them affectionately E. And reading between the lines, even adjusting for the fact that social mores were different back then, you can almost fill in <coughs> the sense that both of them are getting something out of this exchange of letters beyond just the having somebody to talk about ideas and books and whatnot with. Both of them are in some way that neither of them will ever fully acknowledge in the actual text. Having a chance to live a life that they know that circumstances won't actually let them live in reality. Sarah being part of the world of ideas rather than the world of domestic servants. Edward being able to share his life with this vibrant, intelligent, charismatic young woman instead of whoever it is that long, long ago he decided to marry and raise a family with. We don't know how this particular story ended, but because somebody gave Sarah's letters to the museum, we have that rare window into the life of a woman of ideas living at a time when the outlets for a woman of that, with that mental bent were few and far between. One of the things that the documents in the archives can tell us is the history of how things as we know them came to be. This extremely long document, for example, was headed Petition for a New Road. And it seems like fairly boilerplate, yada, 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 Selectmen of the town of Tisbury, we, you know, we humbly ask you to build a road from point A to point B. And then you start to read it and you realize that it's signed by Henry Lawrence Whiting and Everett Allen Davis and William Chase and Ulysses E. Mayhew, the great movers and shakers of what would become West Tisbury. And you start reading the actual description of the road and you realize that what these people are proposing is to reroute the section of what we now think of as State Road around the West Tisbury Village Cemetery instead of as it used to run straight out of West Tisbury Village across the cemetery until it intersected Scotchman's Bridge Lane. As you read this petition, you realize that this is the beginnings of one of the most iconic stretches of road on the near end of Up Island. That place where you take a series of right angle turns past the cemetery, past Alan Whiting's studio, and up the hill past the old parsonage in toward alleys in the church in West Tisbury Center. When you drive into West Tisbury nowadays, you're driving over the world that this document petitioned the selectmen of Tisbury to have made. Conversely, there's this little pamphlet, A History of the Baptist Church of Vineyard Haven. Now that in and of itself isn't so remarkable because there are lots of churches on the vineyard published little pamphlets like this with their histories and we've got many of them. But you look at the title page and you see the date, 1882, the 50th anniversary, pardon me, the 100th anniversary of the Baptist Church in Vineyard Haven, 1882. Not the Baptist church that's there now on the corner of William Street and Spring, but the old Baptist church, the Baptist church that stood on the corner of Maine and Spring. 
big square fronted thing with a rectangular tower that burned to the ground along with every other building on Main Street on that terrible night of August 11th, 1883. As the Baptists of Vineyard Haven gathered to hear the address that was reprinted in this booklet to celebrate a hundred years of their church, their meeting house, their congregation, the building in which they met and whose which was a monument to their success on the island over a hundred years, had about 13 months left before it was destroyed completely. Not everything in the archives documents what once was and is no longer, or what had never been and suddenly came to be. Here, for example, is the map that accompanied a proposal from the Chappaquiddick Association to the town of Edgartown that a, an adequate bridge, an adequate bridge, mind you, be constructed between Chappaquiddick and Edgartown. And the map shows you with nice little red lines exactly where it would go um, just south of the entrance to Caleb's Pond, across the narrows between Edgartown Harbor and Katama Bay. Yes, the Chappaquiddick Association explains at great length. It will cost money, but the improved property tax values on Chappaquiddick will more than pay for it. This was 1925. The town of Edgartown, as you might suspect, said no. They decided to build the new consolidated Edgartown School on Robinson Road instead. And that sucked up all the free money in the budget. And that was it for the great Chappaquiddick Bridge Project. But the people of Chappaquiddick were nothing if not determined. Right then, if you won't build us a bridge, selectmen of Edgartown will go over your head an appeal to the state legislature, House Bill number 254 in the year 1926, an act to set off and incorporate a part of the town of Edgartown as the town of Chappaquiddick. That one didn't work either. But by golly, you've got to give the people of Chappaquiddick circa mid-1920s credit for trying. They were nothing if not ingenious in their desire to become more independent of Edgartown. Not everything that's in the archives is a formal legal document like the petition for the West Tisbury Road or Hezekiah Joel's contract for his privateering money. Some of them some of what's in the archives are things that if you looked at them back in the day when they were new, you'd have said, oh yeah, that's nothing. It's, it's not meaningful. It's not historic. It's not anything. This poster was nailed up on a signboard outside the Rice Playhouse on East Chop Drive to announce the last performance of the season of 1938. And it's folded and battered and torn and it's got holes in the corner. And how it came to survive long enough for somebody in 2013 to give it to the museum, I don't know. But now here in the early 21st century, it tells us once upon a time there was a professional summer theater in which actors and directors from Broadway and Boston and other places came to East Chop and put on plays by name playwrights that for the price of $1.50 in the evening or 65 cents at the matinee, you could come watch them perform in an intimate little theater on East Chop. Summer theater was a thing in the 1920s and 30s, and Fidela Rice of Boston started one 
in Oak Bluffs in the 1920s that ran through 1940 and was revived again briefly in the 1950s. It, it shut down long ago, more than 60 years ago, and its memory lives on in the minds of a diminishing number of people who went to see these performances, but also lives on in the collection of playbills and announcements and one horribly battered poster that made their way into our archives. Or consider this postcard. This is Napoleon Madison, a member of the Wampanoag tribe of Aquina, whaleman in his younger years, who traveled the world as many Aquina Wampanoag did in the service of catching and killing whales and lighting the world with sperm oil and keeping the world's corsets and, and hoop skirts properly proportioned with whalebone. He came home, he settled back down in what was then Gay Head and is now Aquina. He became the chief medicine man of the Aquina Wampanoag. And he posed for this postcard. When I was a summer kid here on the island in the late 60s and 70s, there was a stack of these in the spinning wire postcard rack in every drugstore, every bookstore, every souvenir store down island. It was one of the iconic vineyard postcards. Napoleon Madison was, for me, and probably for an entire generation of summer kids from the mainland, the face of the Wampanoag tribe. This particular card from our large collection of postcards is the first one I've seen in probably 40 years. Times change and people's attitudes towards Native American culture and the complex transaction with white society that Napoleon Madison was engaged in when he posed for this postcard in traditional Wampanoag dress changes. But this postcard and others like it in the archives are there to remind us that this was once a thing. This was once a part of the tourist experience in Martha's Vineyard in the summer. old and faded now, but if you, could, if you get closer to the cover of this booklet, it says, A Song of Summer. And it was made in the late 19th century by a young woman named Jenny Marchant. Her uncle Edgar founded the Vineyard Gazette in 1846. Her father or grandfather Cornelius was the clerk of courts in Edgartown for many, many years. She came from an old, old Edgartown family. And like many well-to-do young women of her age, she learned to do calligraphy, she learned to sketch, she learned to do watercolors. And she painted and drew and composed poetry as a way to fill her leisure hours in a suitably ladylike way. This little eight-page booklet hand-colored illustrations and calligraphied poetry written in calligraphy is her take as a year-rounder. She, her family lived here, was her take on summer on Martha's Vineyard. Sitting at my window in the twilight gray, I can hear the voices of the passers gay. Now it is the stranger and his tone so clear float upon the stillness as these words I hear. Good old Martha's Vineyard, dear old Edgar Town, how I love to summer here and through your streets to roam. That's Jenny Marchant, the girl from the generation's old island family watching the tourist trade come to Edgar Town as it was just beginning to when she wrote this and marveling perhaps at the fact that people would come all this way 
and pay all this money to spend summers in the place that to her was just home. The booklet is filled with delicate little illustrations of things that aren't there anymore. The old wooden Edgartown lighthouse with its zigzagging bridge where lovers went strolling in the moonlight. The train that once connected Oak Bluffs and Edgartown to try and bring tourists from the steamer landing to what was still in the 1870s and 80s a relatively economically depressed backwater. <clears throat> Jenny Marchant's little booklet and dozens of other similar constructions like them are glimpses not just into an era in the history of the vineyard and an era in the history of Edgartown, but into the life of a privileged, leisured, upper-class young woman waiting in all likelihood for the day when she would get married, put aside her paints and her calligraphy pens, and get down to the business of being somebody's wife, somebody's mother, and fulfilling what was what she would have been raised to see as her ordained role in 19th century society. This particular little bit of art is significantly less elaborate. Whoever drew it was not an artist on the level of Jenny Marchant. But it is the shield of Mayhew as displayed in Great Cloister Vault of Canterbury Cathedral. And there's a description below in full-blown heraldic language of what exactly the Mayhew coat of arms. Ghouls, a chevron there of Canterbury bells, question mark, and three crosses or, which is basically just the fancy $5 Latin description of what's on that coat of arms. This was received by the museum in 1939. Clearly somebody who claimed kinship with the Mayhew family had gone on a vacation to England and seen this coat of arms at Canterbury Cathedral and been very excited. And they copied it down and colored it in and, and wrote down the heraldic description. And written very, very lightly in pencil, as professional archivists will do, the very bottom corner, there's a quiet notation with the initials of our long-serving genealogist, K. Mayhew, and it says simply, wrong family. I look at this periodically as a reminder that all of us, even professional historians, are fallible, and our judgments about what it is a particular document means are always subject to revision by somebody else who comes along later and has access to information or to a perspective that we ourselves at the moment didn't have. We have thousands upon thousands of documents, photographs, ephemera, postcards, maps, any number of other things in the archives, but the reason they're there is because in every one of those cases, somebody looked at it and said, wow, that's really interesting. That tells part of the vineyard story. I wonder if the historical society or later, if the museum would be interested in having this. And the archive continues to grow because people continue to ask that question and to call us up or come in or email us and say, hey, I've got this thing. Would you be interested in it? Back in 1970, Tony Bellis was doing his BA thesis at Wesleyan University in English and Art, and he proposed to come to the vineyard in the winter, take photographs, and collect them into a book that documented life on the vineyard in 1970 in the winter, after the tourists went home, after the souvenir shop shut down, 
after the island went back to being what the island had been for centuries. Just six sleepy little towns surrounded by each other. And earlier this year, Tony came in and said to Bonnie Stacy, our chief curator, would you like this, which is my bound copy of that 1970 thesis with the original typed essay and the original hundred or more black and white photographs tipped into the pages? And would you like the binder full of negatives and contact sheets that were the photographs I took that didn't make it into the finished project? And would you like this envelope of random photos I took when I was freelancing for the Gazette a couple of years out of college in 72? Selectmen's meetings and high school basketball games and stuff like that. And, oh yeah, I founded this, this conservation and community protection organization called Martha 72. Um, and we used to have bumper stickers. And I've still got one. Would you like that? And I was there when he was having this conversation with Bonnie and my jaw dropped because, again, summer kid, nine years old, I remember Bartha 72 bumper stickers being everywhere for a year or so. That being the beginning of the great seismic shift away from development as an unalloyed good to some people continuing to see development as a purely unalloyed good and an economic engine and other people saying, oh, wait a minute, maybe we should think about some limits on development because we're not sure that the island's going in a direction that we're going to be happy with in 50 years. Martha 72, like the Martha's Vineyard Commission, like Felix Neck Wildlife Sanctuary, like the Land Bank, like countless other organizations, was an outgrowth of that shift. And the Martha 72 bumper sticker was, at the time, a visible signature of it. And yet bumper stickers are the most ephemeral of ephemera because they only survive if you don't use them for their intended purpose and stick them on the bumper of your car. The thing in your attic, in your drawer, in your trunk, in the bottom of a shopping bag, in the back of a closet that can help some future historian understand better the times in which we live, in which your parents lived, in which your grandparents lived on the island could be as something as monumental and significant looking as this massive bound thesis. It could be something as seemingly trivial as a bumper sticker that never got stuck, or as a tiny fragment of paper with a few lines of text on it that, to some historian 50, 100, 150 years down the line, will be an irreplaceable window into who we were and what our lives were like here on this island.